Hello and welcome to the Alpha Anywhere demo and Q&A webcast. I'm Dave McCormick, VP of Product Management here at Alpha Software, and I'm pleased to be joined by Dion McCormick, our premier solutions engineer, as well as Sarah Mitchell, in charge of our documentation and now doing an awful lot of our webinars. Today, Dion is going to be giving you a couple of examples of things that he's done, I believe with dashboards and some stuff on encryption. If I'm right, he'll let you know. Uh, but we're also here, of course, to answer your questions. And you could type those questions into the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel. So let's get started. Hello, Dion, are you there? Yes, I am. Good to talk to you, Dave. Excellent. I think you're already presenters. So if you click share your screen, I should be able to see it. Oh, there you are. Great. There we go. Good. Hey, thank you so much. And Sarah, thank you. Um, we really appreciate Airbay taking time out of their schedule to visit with us this week. Uh, it is the middle of summer, kids in camp, kids running around, a lot of things going on there. And uh, we're, are we in July? I forget. Is today July 1st? I, I get Not uh, quite. Just about. No, yeah. end of second quarter. Uh, so tomorrow, I guess, is the 1st of July and 4th coming up around the corner. So I hope everybody has some real fun plans for the 4th. Uh, you know, make sure you're shooting off fireworks. I highly recommend that. That's uh, that's not the recommendation of Alpha Software. That's my personal recommendation. So, <laughs> you know, get mad and email Richard, blah, 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 you know, stuff like that. But um, that does mean we are getting closer and closer every day, every day to Alpha Delphcon 2021, just in October, July, August, September, three months away, beginning of the month. It's going to be awesome. A lot of work is going into that both in terms of some really cool product demos of neat stuff coming down the road, but also training and other elements. High quality video will be provided to the people who are involved because obviously you can't see everything while well, some people are. It's like binging on Netflix. Uh, we're going, you know, Alpha Def Con 2021, our goal is number one on Netflix in the rankings uh, this year. That's our goal. So <laughs> I think we can make it there, you know, I think we just, can do Hulu you, plus to be honest with you. I, yeah. I, we just need 200 million more people to sign up for DevCon 2021. And I think we can make that happen. So let's get out there. Let's sign up everybody who has Netflix accounts. Anyway, we are excited. All kidding aside, there's a lot of work that goes into this and we have a lot of folks who have already signed up. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you for bearing with me while I talk about this stuff, but for folks who haven't make sure to go on, you just go to, alphasoftware.com, DEF CON 2021, hit register now, boom, it will take you through and you'll be set and ready to go. And the price is better than on the day of the event. So it's now's the time to set up. Um, so pretty good stuff from there. So today <clears throat> we got a couple really good questions. Well, hey, first, if you do have questions today, please go to your GoToWebinar uh, control panel, go to the questions area, Put in your questions there. Dave will be monitoring those very closely along with Sarah, and we'll be answering those to the best of our abilities. But actually today, to the two topics I'll be covering actually came in through, um, actually I'm covering three, but two of the topics came in through uh, our guides at alphasoftware.com. So we appreciate people taking the time to write us. That was just to kind of do a little prep work, make sure we have information ready to display and discuss with you. So make sure you use that when you can. If not, again, we do try to answer all of your questions on our uh, on our webinar here today. So go ahead and go to that and put those questions in there. And we'll monitor and get to them as much as possible. And that can be either, either on the content that we cover today or something else that is just burning a hole in your brain. You need to get the information. You need to go from there. Okay. So first, I wanted to cover a couple quick, and, and they're not necessarily new enhancements, just stuff I've discovered. And I wanted to kind of share those with you. It's kind of cool little shortcuts uh, that I think you're going to really like that are in the UX builder. Uh, so first, let's go ahead and go over into my development environment. And I'm going to go open up a, oop, I got to open up my demonstration. Dun, 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 dun. And we'll go ahead and set that up. Go here and go into a customer UX. So I'm going to go into a UX builder. I was just working with it. You know, one of the, you know, a lot of work has been done in the last few releases to continue to optimize the development environment, i.e., trying to make the productivity of the developer as high as possible. So a few neat things that came on recently, you've already seen ad control. So, so funny, it's taken me a long time to actually use that because I'm so drilled into going to, you know, I kind of memorized where everything was at. So I would always go down that pipe to go find that stuff. And I'm realizing 
it's wasted time. Whereas I can just click here and then find the control I want very quickly. But there's a number of other things I've discovered, and I bet they've been in there for a long time that I wanted to share with you. First and foremost is that when you are on a field, if you right click it, there's a few cool things you can do. Add to bookmark controls so you can bookmark where your controls are. So if you're hitting a control and you have a very complex UX, you can have that bookmarked control available from there. But the ones I found which are really nice are these label position, label alignment. So traditionally I'd go, oh, customer ID, okay. I want that to say customer space ID and I want it to be um, at lo a certain location. So I'd have to click on the field, scroll all the way down, find the label section, the field label section. I could then change the label there, but then I could also change the position and the alignment. And I do that, maybe do some copy paste, but here I can just go, boom. I don't have to go dig it out. I can say, oh, you know, I ran this. I didn't like where it was. So I go right in here and I say, okay, um, you know, re pre or select a different setting. Same thing for label linemen, you can do all there. And you can even set all controls right from here. So if you wanted to set all controls to have the same label alignment or position, you could just do that right here instead of having to go to the right, find the parameter, modify it, and then maybe use our friendly copy paste attributes to do that. So those are a couple little simple things you can do here, which are really handy. And again, I'm using it more and more because you'll run it and you'll say, oh, that label's in the wrong place, or I wanna do something differently. And those goes along, that goes a long way with like, for instance, the percent thing. So I can say, you know, I want this to be a certain percentage of the width of the container it's in. So those are all these little handy little tools that will make you more productive when you're developing because every moment you can change, you know, save is a moment you can spend more on creative endeavors and working with your clients and other pieces along those lines. By the way, let me go ahead and click bookmark control right here. Okay. And I'll go ahead and click bookmark control here. And then you'll notice up here, we have two areas. One, uh, we have bookmark controls and we also have comments. So I can show the comments for a control. So for instance, if I'm on a control, and let's say it's a complicated one, I can actually view and edit a comment. I can say, this control is very cool. And you can also do it in HTML if you want to get fancier on that. So we'll keep that there. But then what I can do is when I'm on there, I can click here and you'll see the comment, but also you'll notice that in the comment, or the comment is shown here on the right-hand side. So that's handy when you get a much more complex UX Sometimes you kind of figure out where things are at, what they're for. Maybe there's a lot of controls that look similar. It allows you to do that. And again, I highly recommend if you get to a certain point where your UX is very complex and very large, uh, you know, you're going to have a penalty downloading that because it's just the more stuff you have in a UX, the longer it takes. Make sure you evaluate embedded controls so you can embed uh, objects in there. You can embed other UXs, grids, et cetera. So it'll allow you to sort of subdivide and break your bigger controls into model. Like, so for instance, I had a control recently, just to give you an experience on this, is that I had this information, then I had a very complex kind of search criteria information where I wanted to do some searching and other things like that. Well, what I did is I created a panel card, put that stuff in there on a separate UX, and I was able to connect them together. So you're able to take these more complex controls, break them into smaller pieces, which allow you much quicker, you know, kind of editing of each element. And just, it makes it easier to manage things. If you have to fix something, you don't have to go through 50 or 100 or 200 controls. You open up something with maybe 10 or 20. And again, Alpha will take care of making sure all those controls are put together and they coordinate other pieces from that standpoint there. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you, which is a really cool productivity that I found recently, which is pretty cool. is like, let's say I create a JavaScript action. So I'm going to click over here. And again, what I like to do is you can go ahead and go into a button and click like action JavaScript and do that. These are all pre-made. That's why they're showing text mode there. But, you know, I often like to consolidate and centralize all of my uh, action JavaScript. So I click here and then I create my message. So like, let's say show message is one. And these could be very complex. They could open other UXs. They could open A5W pages. They could do panel card modification, navigation, et cetera the sky's the limit. So I'm going to go ahead and say show message. I'm going to go ahead and open that up. And now I'm in my action JavaScript builder and I can say, you know, I'll do a transient message. And I'll say hello. And I'll do it in the top. 
Okay. Now, if I want to show that, and everything's good from there, I'm save that, I'll click OK. I can then go over here and say, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and create a button. And I'll say show message. And I could pick a some, uh, um, yeah, I could preview sub themes and do all that stuff here. There's also new additions here that are fairly recent, which allows you to do things like wrap it in a language tag or text dictionary. And this allows you to then use the built-in kind of multilingual functionality of the system to be able to dynamically display different like text for this button when it comes up. Very powerful, very nice, especially if you're dealing with like, you know, multi-languages in your application. So I'm going through the step of first step is I'm creating the button. Second step, I can go down in here and I can, I have two ways I can go ahead and access that central JavaScript action. One is I could click add action and click run action. This opens up a little selector and I can select my action to run. So think of it as just like a pointer. It's going to basically say, oh, run at that from there. So that's nice and handy there. Or if I want to, let's go ahead and delete that action. I can go to text mode, go here and see you'll have a action JavaScript builder. And you can say insert the code and select the code there. And you're good to go from there. So this is essentially equivalent to that run action there. But again, what will happen is when this button's clicked, it's going to go, oh, OK, go find this action called show mat action or show message and run it. And so now we have that. Let's do a show and let's make sure it's working properly. And then I'll get to the heart of the matter of why I'm showing you that there. So we'll go down and all the way down there and then click show mat message. Did it, oh, let me do this. Let me just move that up to the top. That way we can see it. Did I say show message? I'll have to go and make sure. There it is. So it shows that message right there. But you notice it took me a couple steps. Had to, you know, again, I want to encourage centralizing your action JavaScript. It really makes a huge amount of difference. It's easy to go find. There's things aren't buried anywhere. But let me go ahead and show you a cool little trick. So I'm going to get rid of that button there. And I still want to have the same kind of process. So I'm going to go over here to my JavaScript actions. I'm going to select my JavaScript action. You'll notice down here, there is a link that says create button to execute selected action. Hmm. Click on that. It says now the button has been created and you just need to do a control V. So I'll click OK. I now exit out of there. I hit control V. And there's my button. And you'll notice it took care of writing all this for me. So I took out like two or three steps because I just have to say there, I'll probably change the name of that button, maybe the styling. But the effect is the same. Now I have this action, works great. And it takes care of like fumble fingers and again, having to do all the other pieces there. So that's a real cool feature. It's just been recently added. And again, it says create button to execute selected action and uh, allows you to do that from that standpoint. One other thing why I'm here, which is really handy and I've been using actually a lot lately, is remember when you have a set of JavaScript actions and as your UXs get more complex, they are going to, you're going to have a bunch of different actions. So what you can do is you can use these tools down here. For instance, I can duplicate that message, or I'm sorry, I can duplicate an action. I'm gonna call this show message to. And now in this, I can just go in there very quickly and then say, you know, test, I'm done, I've got it. So duplicating, and if you have, if this action JavaScript has like four or five steps, Again, it will duplicate all of those and then you can go in and tweak them. So it's a really handy tool there. Now, another really handy tool is often you're working on your application, then you're on a like a UX and then you go, you know what, I'm creating a similar UX that's going to have similar behaviors. I'd love to be able to use that action JavaScript, but maybe I've already created that new UX. So all I have to do here is do the copy paste actions. I'm going to say copy the actions to clipboard. I select the ones I want, one or more. And boom, they're now in there. So now I can go into that other UX, click copy paste actions, and I select paste actions, select the ones. Notice it's telling me what's on my clipboard. I select those and then paste them and boom, they're in there. Then I can go in and tweak them to do that. So if you have some action JavaScript that you've used a lot, you can copy them between different UX. It's very, very simple. Very handy tool that I use. So these kind of Duplicate action and also copy paste actions, they've been there for a while, are handy. 
and then the create button to execute selected action is new. And again, saves you a couple steps of having to do it. Plus it encourages you to basically create all your action JavaScript one place and then create buttons to trigger those, which is often the most common trigger for an action. Although you can put that. Now, last thing here, as you can see, click here to see the JavaScript code and it shows you that code right there. You can copy that to clipboard and then go into your UX and put that into a different location. Maybe it's gonna be on a list action or something along those lines. So a lot of handy stuff there. So those are just some tricks, sort of UX builder capabilities that you should check out. Uh, what you'll find is it just saves you a few moments of time here and here, and it's going pretty good there. Um, okay, so next I wanna show, but I'm gonna, I wanna show the next thing, which is data encryption tools. And again, this is sort of an overview of what's in there, but before I do that, I would like you to see if there are any questions out there. Um, there are no questions on the stuff that you just went over. We do have a few questions on different topics, but if you want to keep going, we could do that too. Okay, cool. Let me get that set up real quick. All right. Okay. Okay. So data encryption, super important, becoming more and more important as you notice all the ransomware and all the problems out there, plus hyper important if you're going into certain Industry, or industry verticals such as fintech, finance, or more importantly into the medical area with HIPAA because there's a lot of restrictions about making sure you're taking personal information and encrypting them into the system. Uh, you know, it just, there's regulations, there's requirements that need to be met. And what's nice is Alpha has a lot of built-in functionality to help you do it. And actually those functionality is getting easier and easier to use and more and more useful from the standpoint of adding to it. Uh, so it's becoming kind of part of the fabric of Alpha Anywhere. So I wanna go through a set of different, and just this is just touching on them to let you know where to find them. There are a different set of encryption tools that are built into Alpha that you can avail yourself out. There's some built-in X basic functions. There's a UX field encryption tool that just came out that kind of facilitates that. There's also list field encryption, and then also data table encryption that uses an X basic function. Uh, and this just touches barely on the, the bunch of them that are in there. Uh, there's a lot of base capabilities in there and things that will have help make your life very, very, very um, happy because Alpha is going to do the heavy lifting for you. You don't. So the first thing I want to do is there's a number of different X basic functions that are built into it. And remember, if you're using this information, let me go back here. I go to the handy dandy Alpha Anywhere documentation site. And then, you know, you can, uh, encryption. you know, and so I'm, I'm picking out some from here and I'll show you those in a bit, but you can just use the alpha documentation site to get information on that. So this one's actually new. It's called a five encrypt table field. And that's really cool. It's an X basic function. Let me see our documentation. I know we're doing a little catch up on that. There's been so many, yep, there we go. And this basically is a cool feature that allows you to uh, encrypt and decrypt stored data in a table field. So if you're writing XBasic, this allows you to very quickly encrypt data, then store it into a field and then decrypt it, pull it out of it. And that's really nice to have because it takes, instead of writing five lines of code, it's a single line of code that makes your life. And this is a fairly new solution uh, that came out from the development team. And so check that out. It's called A5 Encrypt Data Field. Again, as you can see, it's very simple. You're basically just, um, running this field, telling it what connection string, what table, what field, and then what key you want to use from there. Uh, that key is used to do the encrypt decrypt, so you want to be very careful about using that. And there's also a video in here that walks you through that scenario. So the this is a new feature. It's one of the many X basic functions that are in there that allow you to encrypt and decrypt data with a key. And you're going to find it's really easy to use and it makes it easy to you, for you to extend your capability here. Another one, I'm not gonna go into much details on these, but PDF encrypt, so you can create a, a PDF file. You've always had the ability to generate PDF for reports and other things like that, but you can also use an XBasic command to encrypt that information. Uh, very, very handy, very simple, and again, a real simple to implement from the standpoint from there. One I've used a lot, and uh, it's a very simple one, it's called encrypt string, and it's built into the system. So let me go ahead and find that one real quick for everybody. Okay. 
And this one's really straightforward. It basically takes a string and a key. So for instance, you go encrypt string, screen key, and then it spits out a very encrypted. This is super nice because it just is, you know, it, it it's a nice, simple to easy to implement. And so if you're just like doing things like, you know, you want to give people encrypted pieces of information through email and other things like that, really handy uh, to use this, or you want to put like a encrypted key into a URL so people can't kind of decode it or try and understand it, there's, you can use this as a mechanism to generate those pieces from there. Um, and so that's really, and then there's an alternate, there's a associated called decrypt string, which does the option, it takes that string in the same key and spits out the result uh, in terms of what you're looking for. They're kind of two sides of there. So that's a handy little function that you can use that I think you'll find really handy. And also there's a number of encryption functions that are industry specific. And let me go ahead and go back and locate that. Go back up here. Okay, so you can see that we support a number of different Base64 and other things uh, that are in there that help you when you're, set, especially when you're integrating with other systems that may require some encryption to send information back and forth. You can use these in your XBasic to be able to interact with those. And you can create hashes, there's MD5. Uh, so there's a lot of different of these built into it. And let me go ahead and copy this from the right location and put that in there, go to the chat. There we go, okay. Now, the last item I'd like to cover, which I kind of skipped, but uh, I don't have it on this list, but there's one that's really, really handy is, um, and let me go back here, it is the list encryption. So let me go back a couple I saw, go back, maybe it's there, okay. There we go, okay. So in the list control, and this is fairly recent, is the ability to encrypt data right in the list control, which is important because if you're building your list control, uh, you know, your application to be list control specific, uh, meaning you're using that versus UXs or grids or things like that, it's built into it. And so again, it's built where you can click on a field that's in your list control. You can say encrypt the field with the key and then that would then take care of all the encryption stuff for you. And you'll notice in here too, uh, the encryption key can be defined at design time, or you can use the session my key. You can actually store the encryption key in a session. And we've made some modifications on sessions to be able to make it more uh, protected. So there's a lot of work actually going on underneath the covers you don't even see uh, that will allow us to properly kind of hide that information on the server so people can't go in and hack different information and other pieces from there. And obviously, very important, if you deploy your application, make sure to deploy it with HTTPS, obviously, instead of standard. In fact, a lot of places like Google and stuff like that are getting really antsy on that, big warnings and stuff like that. But that will allow also another layer of protection for your applications there. Now, one last thing real quick is a brand new feature, which is similar to the list one, is called the UX field encryption. And let me go into that. I'll show you a real quick view of that. So I can go into mine here. I can click a field and then I can scroll down to the data binding area. And you'll notice there's a new field here called, in, or a new um, parameter called encrypt field. And I can click here and you'll see that I put in this key. So I can either be a dedicated key or I could do something like session dot, um, dot my key. And remember, you can change that key differently for different people who log on the system. So there's some really cool, powerful things to do. And then what will happen is the information in this field will be encrypted for you. So you don't even have to do anything along those lines, which is really handy uh, because then when that data is stored in the database, it's stored in an encrypted fashion. So if someone were to hack in and get access to your database, they're gonna see a lot of like just strange strings in there, like for a social security number. A great example of that is SSN where you wanna protect that social security number, even like a date of birth or things like that, you can set those up and then have alpha take care of encrypting and decrypting that data. Very important, don't lose your key <laughs> because there's nothing we can do to help you. Once we can't decode it ourselves, you know, it's based on very strong algorithms. So uh, make sure if you write your keys down, protect them, put them somewhere else, uh, 
you know, don't be like those guys with Bitcoin who throw away their hard drives and they're in a landfill worth uh, half a billion dollars or something like that. Uh, not a good scenario from that standpoint there. So those are that was a quick and dirty for the encryption capability. Again, we have X basic functions. You can do it in the UX now, also in the list. And you can also run actual data table encryption where you can you know run a little X basic command to encrypt your current data and be able to do things in X basic versus having to do it in a list or in a UX control. And all of that is built in. Some of it's a little newer than later, uh, but you'll find they're very simple and easy to implement. And uh, I hope you, you know, get a chance for that. So I'll take a breather here, see if there's any. Fantastic. Boy, do we have questions today. So many oh, questions. Good. Excellent, I know, there we go. <clears throat> so um, let's start with, actually, let's start with the very first question, just to be fair, um, who, who wrote in just as it, as it was opening. And it has to do, this question has to do with lists. And the question is, they have a UX, and on it, there are two lists. And so one of the lists determines what's going to be in the other list. What they want to have happen is when they click on a row on one list, it filters and just shows relevant records in the second list. They have that part working. What they want to know is when the UX first opens, how do they prevent that second list from showing all records? Like, how can you make sure that it just remains blank until something is selected in the first list? Okay, first and foremost, um, you can set up the filtering so that the second list is built on the first one, meaning it's linked. So if, you know, when you build that sort of filter between the parent and child list, um, if, the second list filter doesn't return any records, it's gonna be empty. But there's an easier and simpler way. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a second list here. And I'll just go list orders. Okay. And we'll go in this list of orders. Oops, wrong one here. And you would go in and you'd say, okay, it's SQL, selected from here, selected from here. Um, Let's say it's orders that are related, field list, boom, 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 boom. Um, actually, let me go ahead and do all those here, okay? And you can do filters and stuff. But what you want to do here is now I'm going to do this parent list concept. So I'm going to say there's a parent list and there's a list of orders here. Now, and I'm going to double check on this, but what's important is that if I go to list properties, you're going to see something very important. So I'm going to scroll down here. I can say, delay render until either visible or explicit refresh. So if this other second list is like in a pop-out panel card, all you have to do is click that and what it will is it won't render that list so they don't see it until it comes out. My guess is it's on the same page. So now you can say delay render until explicit refresh. So what does that mean? That means that when it gets displayed, it's not gonna automatically go and try and call and render the information on the backend database. It's gonna wait for you to explicitly tell it to render. And how do you do that? How you do that is pretty straightforward. Oh, oh, I'm just gonna cancel out of there. I don't wanna go through all that. But if I go to my actions and I'll say update li or refresh list, there is, if you go into action JavaScript, and you go uh, list control, because in the action JavaScript, some things are more complex. So you'll see that there's a single list control actions here. But when I double click on that, it actually shows me another selector with a ton of things you can do. Again, they didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they didn't want to junk up the top level list, you know, with all of these things. So that's the way there. But you'll see there's something that says refresh data and say, okay. And then I pick the list I want to refresh. Boom. So now when this action JavaScript is executed, then it will trigger the refresh of that list. Now, what I can do is now that I have that, I can click here to see the JavaScript code. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that. So I could do one of two things. I could add a button in there like I did before to trigger that, or I could go into list of customers. I can go down here to list events. So I'm in list of customers. There's two ways to get this. I can go to list properties, scroll down and you'll see there's a whole bunch of action or there's JavaScript that can happen. 
or I can go to down below and just click list events and it brings up an alternative view of that. And so you can see one of these, if I select there, it's called on click. So when someone clicks on the list, I can then say, you know what, run that refresh list and boom, it'll refresh the list and apply all the requirements in terms of parent child and things like that. Now, the other alternative instead of on click, which you'll wanna know is something called on select. Or is it go ahead and type it here on select. And what that means is the following is that on click is when the user either taps or clicks on a row on the list. If, um, if in your situation, the list could be selected with another method, like you want it to always default to show the first thing selected or some other elements along those lines that maybe gets programmatically selected, then you wanna just use the on select so that anytime that row is selected either through a person clicking or through another method, then you will see, uh, it will trigger this action, whereas on click will only be when the person touches it or clicks it from that standpoint there. So the, the benefit is, again, when you set up your second list, make sure on the list properties, oh shoot, well, I, since I didn't save that, go on there and select the refresh, you know, uh, display on refresh, explicit refresh, and then once you have that, then go out and create your refresh action to update there. And then that way, the first one will show, but the second one won't actually be refreshed and won't show the data until you tell it to do so from there. And thus, you won't see all the records from that standpoint. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, next question, a little bit different. Um, it says This person says they need a button in a UX to hide or show another control, like in a toggle. And they were wondering what method you might use to do that. Okay, I run that real quick. Uh, you have sure. a second uh, button. So you have a, you have a button on a UX control. Okay. And it hides, it toggles the visibility of another control. Oh, okay. It's another control. Yep, so uh, basically, the way I like to do that is that um, there's the simplest way to do it is let's say this whole area here, like let's say I have another control. So I'll just go ahead and put in a text box that I wanna do that, okay? So I'll put that in there. So what I can do is I can simply go and put a container around here. And I do that for two reasons. One, it's nice for organization. If I have multiple controls, I can manage them all at one time. And I'll call that container three. The other thing I like is prevent container float. And what that does is that if this is hidden, it basically squeezes the space on the page so that any, you know, that this lines up right on top of what's after it. If you don't, you kind of get this little gap in your user interface and it kind of makes it look a little, uh, just not as refined from that standpoint. Now, let's say I want to toggle that container. I can sit there and go into my action builder. I would normally go here and do that, but I'll go ahead and I'll say container. Uh, let's see, that's container window. Oh, wait. Um, I like actually, oh, there it is. Toggle display of a container or div with animation. So I go mo mode. So I will select container and I'm going to select its container. I think I said three is what it is. Let me make sure that's right there. Yep, container three. Okay. So let's give that a try real quick. And this is a toggle function. So there, toggle it, and you'll notice. And again, it's trying to align everything after it, you know. So this disappears. Notice it's disappearing and it's showing. And then when it shows, because it has new pages or new space, it's trying to align everything nicely for you. Um, so, for instance, on this container here, uh, I might change the organization how they go so it lines up. That looks a little awkward to me, but that's how it is. But all you have to do <coughs> is surround things with a container. And then just use the toggle visibility function that will do that toggling of the visibility uh, within the container. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so someone asked today, does does Alpha Anywhere have those built-in analytics and dashboards like we have in Transform? And the answer is no. Transform actually it's got a much more robust system for building out dashboards. But of course, Transform is written uh, using Alpha Anywhere. 
So uh, anything that you can do in one, you can do in the other. So um, yeah, exactly. I see you're on your dashboard component slides. So we may talk a little bit about this at some point uh, about how you put together dashboards a little bit more. And uh, yeah, I kind of wanted to, I, I saw that. And again, thank you for the yep. person sending it in ahead of time. Yep. I want to kind of talk a little bit of philosophically of how I build dashboards using alpha. Right. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and go into that. Um, so dashboards uh, are super powerful and almost every system you know, uses it because it's a way to consolidate information to help people and users get more information out of the system without having to have everything batter, buried from there. So I actually use three core kind of functionality pieces. First and foremost, I build it around panel cards because panel cards are so powerful in terms of um, two things. One is dynamic display, meaning I can show and hide and have cool things pop out and you know drill downs and things like that. So it gives me a lot of flexibility on building the structure of my dashboard. Secondly, panel cards are responsive. So therefore, if I'm viewing this dashboard on a desktop, on a tablet, on a phone, it will automatically do a lot of the work for me to lay it out nicely. And what you'll find is that more and more dashboards obviously are handy in desktop, but a lot of people want to pick up their iPad and kind of look at what are the stats going on in your system. So having that responsive capability is a very, very important um, situation in the scenario within there. Um, so I would first and foremost start with a UX component with panel cards as the basis for my dashboards that I put together. Now, the other technologies I use very heavily are list and view boxes to show columnar information, you know, because your dashboard might be a mix between charts and some text information. Um, then I also use the built-in JavaScript charts functionality to actually display because it's really easy, very powerful and simple. Now, the other cool thing about lists and JS charts is that they are uh, offline compatible, meaning I can set up lists and JS charts. So when the person first logs in, it's going to download the data. So if they jump on a plane and they're not available, they can still access their dashboard information. Viewboxes, there's other techniques to do that, a little more uh, work to do it, but I tend to list those around there. So just to show you how I can set up a very simple kind of dashboard structure in a few minutes, I'd like to go ahead and do that if, um, if folks are interested mm -hmm. from there. Let's do it. Okay, cool. Let's go in here. So I just start with a new X control. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So I go ahead and start using my panel card structure. So usually, uh, depending on how you want to structure it, you're going to either have a, a I'm going to start out with a layout. And let's say I want to have a couple panel cards in there. And a panel card here. So these are a left to right kind of structure here. But remember, I can nest these things within it. So for instance, I can also have another option here, which is a panel um, navigator entity. And then in my panel navigator, I can set a couple cards. And I would normally name all these cards so they're nicely shown and stuff like that. Okay, so now I have my basic structure of my dashboard that I want to put together. And it may not visually make much sense, but basically you're going to have um, three cards on the screen, card one, card two, and card three, but this is actually a, a what's called a navigator, so I can actually have multiple cards. So to show that a little bit more, I'm going to start putting in some content here. So the first thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to do loop navigate, and I want to go down here and say has indicator. That's going to show for my navigator what's going on there. So let's add some content in here. I'm gonna go my panel card number one. So let's say first and foremost, I wanna list my top customers by sales or something like that. So I have two methods to do that. So first I can go in here and the easy one is to do a list control. And I can say top customers. And I'm gonna cheat by using the connection string here. Customer, field list. Okay, and I'm not going to add a detail view or search part or anything like that. I'm going to keep it simple from there. And then on that one, I'm going to make that fill the container. And again, I want to kind of fill these panel cards so they're sort of solid entities within the system. Other thing I'm going to do here is make combat leave. Okay, 
So now I've got my top customers in my first panel card on the left. Next, I want to add a chart with maybe year-to-date activity there. So in that case, I'm going to use a chart component. So I'm going to go down here to define controls, or actually, better yet, I'll just go here. I'm getting so used to it. It's crazy. JavaScript chart. So it puts a cart chart in there. Let's go ahead and save this. Save often. Be kind, rewind. Um, I'll go in here, and I'm just going to select a chart, and what I'm going to do is just click and use a basic one. I'm not going to do anything. Now, I'm kind of using a vertical representation, so maybe I want to use, uh, let's see, horizontal bar. Yeah. There we go. We'll use that one. That's kind of a vertical orientation. Now, I'm going to create and use this, but remember, we can use data series to populate this chart so on the fly, the data would be related to what's in your database. So a lot of documentation examples on that. So I'm going to keep it simple from that standpoint there. Okay. So now I have my two things there. And now for the panel card over here, I'm just going to throw in one other thing. And I wanted to kind of show you how to do this. So in here, I'm just going to throw, um, let's go ahead and put an image in here. And again, the JavaScript charts are great because you can do so many cool stuff with it. I'm just throwing in some images there. Just to have some content in here to show you. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to do is in my panel card number three, which is in my navigator, I want to go in here and I'm going to create and add a view box. Now, the reason I'm saying use a view box is some really cool things about view box. A super, you know, if you want to put an infographic style thing, you can do that. You can make very powerful visualizations using vis view boxes because it's basically HTML, CSS, and your data, and it can be live. So don't you know discount view boxes as a really cool tool to show these elements that go with it there. I'm going to go in there, go into my view box. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and cheat, and I'm going to create a sample one. And let's go ahead and do an image map. And I don't know if it's going to look okay when I get out there, but let's see. Okay, so now let's do a working preview. I've done a lot of work. We're going to see what it looks like. So check it out. So first and foremost, you'll see, oh, here's my list control. And this can have all the power lists. You can even edit records, et cetera, or you could, could navigation. You could sort and sort. And you'll notice how fast. I mean, lists are, they're heavier components than view boxes, but they're very simple. You'll notice in the middle, oh, here's my bar chart. And again, this can be data driven. So, and then last but not least is, oh, check this out. Here is my cool view box. And you can see how powerful, this one's more advanced. That's why I picked it. But you could make like a little infographic there. Like, let's say you're a heavy equipment manufacturer. You could literally create a view box where it had like a picture of product number one, product number two, product number three. And next to it, you could have like a piece of text that basically represents the data on units ship in that month to date or something like that. So it gives you these really powerful visualization capabilities within the system. Now, the reason I mentioned on using the, the uh, panels and uh, the UX is that it's responsive in nature. So let's go back into design and let's go ahead and just make this a mobile representation. Let's do a working preview. And you'll see at this point, I haven't set up my layout rules, but you'll notice that it kind of squeezes things down. So more representation of this would probably be a app, iPad Pro. And now you can see, oh, cool, it looks really nice on an iPad Pro. And again, you can use what's called responsive layout rules to say, oh, if you're on a smaller platform, um, don't put them side by side, use a different way to, to structure that. So it gives you that out to say, I can create very optimized environment, you know, kind of representations for pieces there. But all the basic functionality works exactly the same you're seeing within the system. And then also, we'll take it back out of here. The other thing I wanted to show you is that by using panel cards and panel layouts and specifically panel navigators, you can create very dense representations. So you'll notice here that I've got my list control, my JavaScript, but notice I've got here. So I can actually go in here and use the swipe gestures to swipe back and forth between content. So my density level of information goes way, way up because they can just basically click on it. And again, I'm using a mouse here, 
but it's very intuitive for someone just to be swiping through to see the data that they're interested. And each of these, I have static images, could be list, could be this, could there, and you could even link this stuff together. So when I click this, you could actually have it update the data series and that information so that all of this uh, essentially updates based on this primary rate, because I'm all in the same UX. So if I select this, I could create an on-click event like we did before, and that on-click event could say, okay, refresh other things on the screen. And since I have in this list control, the primary key customer ID, then everything else in these other ones could be linked. Like this view box could say, just give a call to the database and only give me back the records for that customer. So that's a really fast, quick and dirty way to put uh, a dashboard together. But as you can say, it is super nice looking. I mean, it, you know, it really is not hard to put together something very compelling for someone in terms of the view of it. And you have the interactivity of things like this, but more importantly, you have the interactivity of things along the lines of clicking uh, this and then having other pieces of your inter user interface update from there. Actually, I'm gonna, I have to step away for 20 seconds. So. Go ahead and field questions, and then I'll be right back, okay? That sounds terrific. Thanks Thank very you. much. Uh, so, Sarah, I don't know if you're here, but someone asked a question that you answered. Well, I know you're right. I don't know if your audio is on. Someone asked a question uh, that you answered, which had to do with the enter key. How do you use the enter key to simulate an on-click event? And we actually do have documentation for that. And I was wondering if you could paste that documentation in the chat window. Oh, yeah, for sure. That would be great. So that's that's something that I find all the time. Like, uh, for example, I built a, a login UX component. I type in my username, I type in my password, I hit enter because I'm on a keyboard and it doesn't do anything. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I, I The on-click event for the thing is not connected to enter. So that's, uh, so there's the answer for that. I'm back. Uh, sorry, I had to actually get a glass of water. I've been talking so much without any <laughs> liquids. I was like, ah, ah, ah. it's like a, I was about to cough up a hairball. It's not hot down there in Texas, by the way. Is it today? Actually, it's not too bad. We've yeah. actually had a lot of rain this week. It's been pretty pleasant, actually. Oh, that's uh, very nice. Yard's looking yeah. good there. But yeah. uh, it's a head fake. We go to like 152 degrees next tomorrow or something like that. <laughs> yeah, 152. Yeah, that sounds yeah. good. <laughs> 185, uh, baby. <laughs> so I hope that was kind of helpful. And again, I love, I, I really wanted to iterate the view box control because you can go out onto like Fiverr, find some really smart designer and they can create a very cool looking kind of CSS HTML look at. And then you can go in and, and use the view boxes merge capability to take like the numbers and insert the numbers of say information from these. And you can just make them look fabulous and it's not hard with the view box control. So I wanted to stress that as part of your dashboard toolkit. That is excellent. Thanks very much. Um, we have a few questions related back to data encryption. Uh, one of them is, can you encrypt and decrypt session variables? Um, yes, yes, you can. And the reason why is you can use the function string encrypt. So remember, uh, session variables are strings. So you can use, uh, you can just basically, before you store it into, oh, that's table, excuse me. Um, you can use this encrypt string decrypt because what you can do is you can encrypt the string, then store it in your session variable. And then when you use it later on, you can then say decrypt and then extract it out of the session variable and decrypt it at that point and then use it. Um, but again, remember, you got to make sure you're using the proper key uh, to do both so that you get the proper information out of it. Thank you. Um, similar, well, another encryption question, and that is, if I encrypt existing data, do I need to make any changes to my data controls? What about functions that are accessing these? Uh, this data i guess the little more a little more context for that one yeah uh, I, I get it. i'm trying to visualize the right if you could do encryption on the control level and you have a function that refers to that control does alpha automatically decrypt it or does something special have to happen ah good point um yes i think and i i'm going to guess now and i could be incorrect is that okay. when i say decrypt this screen what it's doing is this is again it's data binding so it's right. saying 
pull the encrypted string from the database, decrypt it for me automatically, and present it in the customer ID. Now that it's local on that brow or on that window or on that, my assumption is it's just text, and so you can it's just use text. Like, I mean, it, since you can see it in the browser, there's almost no point in encrypting it at that point. I would assume. exactly, and so right. yep. and then, but then when you change it and save it back, Alpha takes care of saying, "Oh, I'm going to now re encrypt the encryption before it sends it off." And yeah, and it's mainly the idea of yeah. it's called what is it? PIN or PIL? It's personal identification information or something like that. But it's you know like things like zip, uh, uh, social, social security, security number, and things like that. date of birth, yeah. and a few other things that you, the standards are that that inside the database it's not exposable. It's actually encrypted in some way so that if someone gets access to your database, they can't see it. Fantastic. Uh, another question is: Do switch controls um, in in a UX list? Do switch controls work with logical fields? Or are they limited to character fields or another field type? Um, I think you can use them both. Let's go ahead and change this. Let's see, what's a good one here? Oh, I don't have a good data point on here. Let's go ahead and um, uh, go ahead. Mainly they're used for uh, switch. I think you can use them for both numbers. So for instance, you can say the type is like numeric, so one and zero, and um, Text, text. Yeah, I wonder how that does it because I'm not seeing treat as logical here. Uh, I would have to experiment with that to find out for sure. Um, but I know definitely you can, you know, you can save it as either, a, you know, numeric or character. I'm not sure these actually apply, obviously, to a switch control. I mainly use it with uh, one and zero. I've always, um, just personally, um, but I think it may also use true and false for saving it when it's a character versus a numeric. If it's numeric, I've seen it's one or zero from that standpoint. Now that said, you can use different text for the on and off state so that you're not limited, you know, you don't show them zero, you can say, oh, it's false, so you can say not available, or then, you know, let's say it's a one, you can say available. So the actual representation for the human is, um, is gonna be nicely formatted and look good, but underneath the covers, it's gonna use, you know, numerics to, so it's accurate. Okay. Now what about, okay, so now we're going to take the question a little bit further. What about in the list itself as opposed to the detail view of the list? Ah, good point. Uh, so again, my assumption is you're when you're in the list. Place editing, uh, basically, yeah. Yeah, so when you're in the list, again, the idea is when I go to a field and I say uh, encrypt field, it's only when it's going back and forth between the data source. Ah, no, I'm sorry. Back to the question about... Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I thought you were still on that one. Okay, my bad. No, go <laughs> I ahead. Keep, I keep flip-flopping just to make I know. I keep you on your toes today, man. Yeah. <laughs> Bob and weave, baby. Bob and weave. Yeah, so no, the question is still about the switch control. Can yes. it be used with a logical field if that field is in the list as opposed to in the detail view? So you're in a list. Control. Um, You know what? I think what you can do... Can you... Yeah. See, I don't know. Um, I haven't actually seen a uh, switch in the actual list itself versus as a type. the detail view. All right. Uh, now uh, you can mimic it. Well, oh, go okay. ahead. It's the control type setting. You pick uh, switching it from label to switch. Oh, there you go. There you go. See? Ah, yes. This is where you have star, you have uh, switch. So, yeah, the answer would be yes. You can use that within... The list control. Thank you very and much. Now, Sarah. will it work with a logical field? Is the last part of that, and we can test that out. Uh, We'd have to test that later. out. You know. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We'll take that. Out. That is left as a uh, you know homework for the reader. <laughs> I like that cop out when you're like, <laughs> I don't know. So go do the homework and come back and tell me. Well, we'll yeah, we can take a look and uh, to the person who asked that, we will get back to you. We know who <laughs> you are. <laughs> All right. Um, what else have I got here? We are running low on questions. This is actually pretty. That's true. okay. I did not think. I'm looking through this huge page, and I thought we were going to not get to those. So, uh, was it was like half of the five. notes saying buy Do Dogecoin? Was that like half the comments? <laughs> More than you half know? of them. Yeah, exactly. If I'm buying Dogecoin, should I buy now? I'm sorry, we're gonna have to move on. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Uh, got to that. Got to that. Got to that. Ah, we're looking good. Well, thank okay. you, everybody. Yeah, this turned out really well. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Also, come to the rescue and giving us the answers. 
Uh, Sarah will be here next week and we'll be yeah. doing our webinar. Do you want to tell us what you're going to be talking about next week, Sarah? You don't have I'm to. going to guess. She's going to comp she's going to talk about something with competency versus history. <laughs> <laughs> Am I no, right? so um <laughs> I don't I don't have the specific topic nailed down just yet, but I am going to start returning back to the basics of building apps with Elf anywhere and I agree. Over the next couple of sessions taking a look at at where you start and where you go from there. So this has been a while since we've visited those subjects. And if there are things people would like to cover, can they send it to guides at alphasoftware.com? Of course. Excellent. Cool. Hey, thanks everyone for joining us. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Stay well, everyone. And goodbye.